This video is about electronegativity and bonds. You should already be able to describe electronegativity of an atom and identify bonds as covalent, ionic, or metallic using those values and metallic properties. But by the end of this video, you should be able to compare species' electronegativity values based on where they are on a table, the periodic table, because we don't have a table of electronegativities on the exam, and identify and explain dipolar molecules. So the question of the video is why do we see that some particles dissolve and others don't, or why do some of them conduct electricity and others don't? And it really comes down to what type of bond it has and how free the particles are to move. So let's get into the nitty-gritty of it, electronegativity. Electronegativity is a ability of an atom to attract electrons, not to be confused with ionization energy, which is an energy to remove an electron. So this is attracting electrons. Across the period, it increases due to nuclear charge increasing, um, or protons pulling, and they're needing to fill the octet. So the more protons can attract new electrons and fill the octet. Down a group, the electronegativity decreases because electrons are further from the nucleus. It makes the nucleus um, have a hard time attracting those electrons. Therefore, attracting a new electron is going to be even harder. The values range from 0 to 4 because they're not energy values. They're just a correlation between the two um, particles. And then notice that the trend is similar to ionization energy, but again, the, the definition is completely different. If you look at an example of how we're going to write it, it's going to be some atom that gains an electron before the arrow and forms a negative ion, or some positive ion that gains electrons and become an atom. So generally, fluorine is the highest electronegativity and one of the highest ionization energies, so it makes it easier to remember this trend. But remember, that's just a memorization tool. You're not going to say that on the test, fluorine is the highest because it's on the right corner. No, 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 no. You have to go into like protons and shielding and nuclear charge. But it is kind of convenient when you're comparing samples. So electronegativity, like we said, can go from on a scale from 0 to 4. And what you're going to do is compare two atoms' electronegativities and see what their values would come up to as. So for now, if you have an electronegativity table, whether that's the old region's reference tables or somewhere like that else you can look, you can actually look up their values. I'm going to assume that you have one of those tables to move on. So if the values um, are different by anywhere between 0 and 0.4, we're going to consider that bond between them to be a nonpolar covalent bond. If they're anywhere between 0.5 and 1.7, that means when you round to 1, they're different enough to be considered a polar covalent bond. And last, if their difference is any higher than 1.8, we're going to consider that to be an ionic bond. So in a not polar covalent bonds, they're going to be sharing electrons, because covalent means to share valence, equally, because there's no one electron uh, negativity that's higher than the other. In polar covalent, they're still sharing, because that's what covalent means, share valence, but in a polar way, in the sense that one of the atoms is pulling electrons closer to it more of the time. And if they're anything higher than that, we're considering ionic because it transfers electrons to form cations and anions due to that really diff big difference in polarity. So knowing that, we're going to look through some examples from using your reference tables to figure out what type of bond we have. So hydrogen has nonpolar bonds because its difference was zero. Something like CH4 has, also has nonpolar bonds because C and H are close enough that their difference is only 0.4. Now, I actually want you to know that C and Hs have a nonpolar bond, so maybe write that down somewhere. Know that it's nonpolar even though they're the same, not the same element. HC and N has nonpolar bonds because all those are within 0.4 as well of each other. So C and H are nonpolar, and C and N are also nonpolar. Finally, we get to something that has polar bonds. C and O have a different electronegativity enough that they create polar bonds. If you find their difference, it's 0.8, which rounds to a 1, right? Uh, CCl4 also has polar bonds, so carbon's electronegativity is much different than Cl's electronegativity by 0.6. HF has very polar bonds, hydrogen being extremely different than fluorine, by a difference of 1.8, almost ionic. NAI would be ionic because its difference is so high, 1.8, but also because there's a metal in it. So remember we said we're going to look at the electronegativity differences, but also keep in mind metallic properties. If there's a metal in it, ionic. Okay, so this is like a borderline 1.8. It could be covalent if it's nonmetals. It could be ionic if it's metals and nonmetals. So KF, since its um, difference is really big, 3.2 is definitely ionic, but also because it had a metal and a nonmetal. This is all relating back to an old octet rule that atoms bond with other atoms to either share or transfer electrons to receive or attain an, a stable octet of eight valence. So when bonds are formed, energy is released, and when bonds are broken, energy is absorbed. This is something we talked about quite a bit last year. So the types of bonds we just mentioned were ionic bonds, where we transferred electrons from metals to nonmetals. These create really strong bonds because the plus of the cation and the negative of the anion create this nice static electricity between them to pull them together. 
that creates really strong particles that have high melting and boiling points. They might be soluble based on our solubility rules, and they're conducted as a liquid phase because that means that their particles will be spread out in the liquid phase. Um, but generally, they come as solids. So at room temperature, most ionic substances are solids. So they have this crystalline structure where a positive is attached to a negative ion. And then because charges don't really pick and choose what other charges they're attracted to, the plus is also attracted to other negatives and it creates this network. So in the solid phase, you always have this repeating pattern of plus minus, plus minus, plus minus, and a big geometric crystal lattice or boxy structure. And so you can see that looking in if you zoom in here or if you zoom in here. If you either melt or dissolve the particles, the particles start to begin to shift. And you can see that in the second picture on the left, where it's not as pretty, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. And now the ions can move around to conduct electricity. Electricity has to flow through the molten or aqueous solution. And then you can see that here too. If you melt it, they just separate so that there's room to flow before there was not any room in the solid phase. If you dissolve it, the water kind of breaks up the positives and negatives, and therefore, again, there's ability to flow, right? So the positive ions move towards maybe a negative area, and the negative ones move towards a positive area if you have something that's ionic. Here's another picture of that. When a particle is placed into the water, if it's soluble, the particle will get ripped apart by the water. The oxygens of the water that are negative will rip off the positives, and the hydrogens that are positive in the water will rip off the anions. And so that way, that's what it means to dissolve. And once they do that, we can have electricity flow through the system. Our next bond are metallic bonds. They have a sea of electrons. They're metals only with high melting and boiling points, just like normal metals. They're insoluble. I mean, I can't even imagine a metal dissolving in water. And they can always conduct because of these sea of valence electrons. That creates that ability to flow, right? And all other metallic properties you might know, like malleability or ductility. So if you look at it in more detail, if there's um, before, if you looked, there was only one valence electron per atom. But in here, if there's uh, two valence electrons, then you'll have twice as many electrons flowing through the system. Also, metallic bonds are malleable. So if you put an external force on that, they'll just kind of move to the side um, because of the electrons kind of almost greasing up, in a way, the cations. Um, you should think of it like this. So wherever the nucleus are, they kind of probably stay in the same realm unless they're put a force on. And the electrons that were already in the atom are creating a C. And if we put new electrons in, they'll push the old electrons out. So these are the new electrons coming in on the left from a source of electricity. These are the electrons that were already in the system. And then they're being pushed out on the other side. Our last type of bond is covalent bonds, or are also known as molecular compounds. They share electrons within the bond. So you can see these two are shared electrons. They were seven on this side, seven on this side, so the share makes them both have eight. These happen with nonmetals only, and this is a very weak bond, because wouldn't you rather transfer your electrons than share them, just like transferring money than sharing it? So that creates very weak particles with me lower melting and boiling points. Now that's kind of... Iffy, if it's big enough, it might have a higher melting point or boiling point, but we'll get back to that. They're usually insoluble unless they're polar, and they never conduct electricity because there's nothing flowing. This is a very rigid structure, creating molecules. So let's just make sure we can review ionic, covalent, metallic. If there's a metal and a nonmetal, it's ionic. If it's just a metal, it's metallic. If there's only nonmetals, it's covalent. So if you want to pause and see if you got the rest of these, we're just going to go through them really quick now. MgCl2 is ionic. HCl is covalent. We say it has ionic character, though, because if you remember, acids do lose their hydrogens in some cases. CH4 is covalent. H is in the back, so it's not an acid. AlCl3 would be considered ionic, because aluminum is a uh, metal. And H4Cl is considered both ionic and covalent. We want to stop here and pay, pay attention. Covalent because they're all nonmetals, but ionic because, you might remember, NH4 is a ammonium ion. So it has a plus charge, and therefore Cl is minus. That plus and minus makes it have an ionic character. P PBr3 is covalent. CuI2 is ionic. SiO2, covalent. Au is just gold, metallic. Oxygen, covalent. And RBF, ionic. So just looking in more detail about the covalent bonding, because um, there's two types of covalent bonds, as we mentioned before, polar and nonpolar. So when you share electrons, if they're completely shared equally, like in the hydrogen to hydrogen, no um, one particle is stronger than the other. Therefore, we're going to call this a nonpolar bond because they share equally. Fluorine would do this as well with itself because neither of the particles are stronger. So if you like look into the electron cloud, 
um, there's an equal cloud around both the fluorines. The fluorine, this is the bond between them. The bond is not really anything physical. There's not an actual physical thing touching the fluorine to a fluorine. It's the ability for the electrons to be anywhere within this space. And because of that ability, there's like this energy that pulls the two fluorines together. Because the fluorine 1 wants the electron of fluorine 2, fluorine 2 wants the electron of fluorine 1. And when I say they want it, it means their protons are pulling it in, right? If there is an electronegativity difference, that means one side is pulling, its protons are pulling the electrons of the other element in better, and it will have the electrons more of the time. And that creates an uneven bond, such as OH. Um, oxygen has more protons and an ability to pull electrons over towards it more of the time, so it's going to have slightly more electrons than it has protons and be slightly negative, whereas hydrogen is not going to see its own electrons as much, and it will be slightly positive. That's what we call polar. The reason we care about this is because it creates particles that will be attracted or repelled by magnetic fields. So originally in a regular container, they can kind of orient with pluses or negatives near the top, doesn't matter. But if you put an electric field on, the negative side will attract all the positive parts of the atom or molecule, and the positive parts will uh, attract all the negative parts of the molecule. And then they'll all kind of line up and be really organized. So something we think about, again, I wanted to bring up, what even is a bond? Yeah, and like, is it a physical thing? Again, no. There's not an actual piece. I know when we create models, we use like a either a wire or a wooden piece that connects the bond, but there's really nothing there. It's just the ability for electrons to either be there or not, or the ability for a positive to attract a, a negative. And that force or that energy is what we're calling the bond. Okay, so just make sure that we know that there's nothing actually there. At this point, you should be able to describe and compare electronegativity values of atoms. Identify bonds as covalent ionic or metallic using both electronegativity values and metallic properties. And then identify and explain dipolar molecules.